everyone. Welcome to another amazing episode of Green Hope Foundation's Women Impacting the World series. I'm Kehakusha, Founder President of Green Hope Foundation, and I will be one of the moderators for today's episode. And joining me today as co-moderators are Tanya, Head of Green Hope Bangladesh, and Madhumita, Campaign Officer of Green Hope Foundation. And today we are so honored to have with us someone whom we all look up to and who <laughs> exemplifies leadership, determination, and success. So the discussion on gender equality has not, it's not, not a really a modern phenomenon because it was a matter of debate even during the ancient times with Plato's Republic elaborating on it at length. And in the 2000 years that have elapsed since then, the question remains, what has really changed? Because while women have stepped out on spacewalks, there are millions in another part of the world who don't even have the freedom of stepping out of their own homes without a male escort. And while we have women excelling in every sport and in every corporate role, their male counterparts continue to outnumber them overwhelmingly, all while getting paid much more. So the starkness in, of this disparity may vary depending on the country or region, but it remains nonetheless in all societies manifesting itself every day, sometimes with very violent consequences. And in times of war, upheavals and disasters, we women and girls are affected disproportionately. And even during this current pandemic, women and girls have had to bear inordinately severe consequences managing homes and remote work at the same time. And while there are no numbers as of yet, many developing countries are actually noticing an upsurge in the school dropout rate of girls from vulnerable communities since they need to either make way for boys in the family or are put to work to supplement income. So the fact remains that we continue to be dispensable and our struggles continue from womb to the tomb. But amidst all of this adversity, women continue to break through and create a space for themselves recognized on sheer merit and determination. And this web series, Women Impacting the World by Green Hope Foundation, recognizes these intrepid leaders sharing their journeys so that they can inspire today's girls to dare to dream. So with us today is Dr. Chandeline Carpentier, who has been my personal inspiration since 2012. When as a 12 year old, I began my journey on the international stage at Rio Plus 20. So welcome, Dr. Carpentier. We are truly honored to have you with us today. Thank you, Kikesh, and it's a real pleasure for me to be here with you. And thank you for these kind of worlds. And yes, you're right. The situation is not too good, but we will keep on working at changing this, this situation together. <laughs> Absolutely, yes. And it is so great for us as well to have role models such as you to look up to and know that that is what a successful person looks like. And I think that is how to get, working together, we will be able to change our world for the better. And we wanted to start by asking you, you have accomplished so much in uh, your life. So how did you start your journey with the United Nations and what was your motivation behind joining the UN? Well, thank you, Kikashana. And um, so basically, as you know, I used to work at the NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement for uh, uh, and the Commission for Environmental Cooperation that was created because the NAFTA was the first agreement between developing and the developed nation. And so we, um, the member states, under the pressure of the civil society, especially environmental group, wanted to make sure that we document the environmental impact of trade liberalization between developing nations and developed nations. Um, and so the CC, the Commission for Environmental Cooperation, was created. So there, I was in charge of document, developing the methodology to, to document the environmental impact of trade liberalization. Um, and so I did that during uh, seven years, uh, five years as the director of the um, trade economics um, and environment division. 
But after several years, Kikeshan, what I realized is that there are also a lot of trade, um, a lot of social and labor issues, and we were not allowed at the CEC to work on them because there was another part of the NAFTA agreement that created a small commission on labor, which was pretty much ineffective. So I decided that I wanted to work more on um, also the social and the labor issues. And believe it or not, I applied online um, at the UN. And it turns out that at that time, that was pre-Rio, we still had the Commission on Sustainable Development that was following up on the Earth Summit. And since the round that was, was coming up was on sustainable agriculture, regional uh, rural development in Africa, and it matched perfectly with my skill set and the experience I had, I was, um, I was hired. And I didn't realize actually that it was, it was difficult to join the UN at that time because it was just, um, the timing was perfect. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. And wow, that's, and you have been able to uh, do so much. And we're so excited to hear from you uh, today more about your journey. And I'm sure our viewers are very excited to see how they too can emulate uh, that and become super successful in their own uh, zones of influence. So I shall now pass on the floor to Tanya. Tanya, are you with us? I think Tanya has been experiencing some tech difficulties, but uh, if not, then I think I can move on to our next question, which we wanted to ask you. Uh, we all know that as women, we face a lot of unique challenges. And, you know, I'm sure that all of us have faced different challenges in, uh, in our journeys and in our lives. So we wanted to know what challenges did you face in your journey and along the way? And were there any specific challenges that you faced as a woman in the field specifically? Yeah, well, you know, it, it's interesting and it's an interesting question. And then I've been reflecting on that. It's, it's, it's not an easy answerable question for, so basically I graduated um, in uh, 19, uh, in 1990, uh, I got my bachelor's and in 92, my master's and 96, my uh, PhD. And at that time, of course, I was in agro agricultural and environmental economics. It was a male dominated field, but I never felt um, that because I was a woman, it was more difficult. Uh, until actually I reached my late 30s, uh, 40s, because when it's once you go up and you get to the senior management level that you start actually seeing the discrimination. Uh, before, my problem were mostly because I was too ambitious for the, the size of my teams and the resource I had. Um, and so that was not related to being a woman. It was just being a person with a lot of drive and wanting to change the world. But then through my mid, uh, once I get to the senior position, and I'll give you a specific example, at the NAFTA, I discovered by pure chance, because one of my male colleagues had left his space slip on his desk, that he was paid $18,000 more than me just because he's a man. We had similar education. Actually, I had higher education and similar work experience. And so I went to the HR and asked why I was paid less than my colleagues. And you wouldn't believe, um, be, everybody on this on this webinar won't believe that this is in nine in 2000 uh or 2002 no 2004 probably uh 2005 that i was told that I, I was paid less because i didn't have a family to support and at that point i just left the room and gave my resignation and said it was not acceptable and that situation was corrected uh within um hours but still, I had to resign to be able to be paid the same amount as my men co male colleague with the same um, experience. And I had a PhD and that person didn't have a PhD. And then Kekeshani kind of hit home also. Um, and that I forgot. I just thought maybe it was just a one-off um, occurrence. Then my, at my 25-year reunion uh, at McGill, of graduation, I was invited to give a keynote to women in science at McGill, especially at McDonald College, where we have a lot of the sciences. And I was all excited about it because it was all women in science. And I do believe that it's important for women to be in science and, and actually um, influence the, the thing that we research and the, the findings. 
And then I started doing my research and it was so <laughs> disappointing. This is at the time where we had, and if you haven't seen it, the Google the hashtag distractingly sexy, where actually the Nobel Prize Tim Hurt had just um, been fired or was being in the process of being fired because he had said that women were to um, cry too much or should not be in a lab, but the, because they either cry or you fall in love with them and it's never good. And this is at the time where we're trying to convince young women like you to go in science and, and have a career. And this is coming from a, a Nobel Prize uh, winner. So I was like, okay, this is not good. Um, and then I started doing some research on, um, on these topics. And all my life, it's kind of funny because I kept thinking, because I have a French accent, because I only learned English when I went to McGill, that when I said something in a meeting, and the male next to me, because I was in the male dominated field, uh, would repeat the same thing or say the same thing, but now it came from him. Everybody was like, oh, that's a great idea. And it, it took 25 years later when I was preparing for my speech for the women in science to realize that it's called mansplaining. And the fact that, um, and men interrupting, where men will interrupt you and basically take your idea and say it, and now all of a sudden, um, they would have more credibility because they are men and a woman, as opposed to a woman. Um, or that a man next to you would explain to the group something that you're actually an expert on. Um, and then the other one that is my favorite I discovered was the bro-propriating, the bro-propriating. So you as a woman say something and you come with an idea, they, they, they take your idea and they appropriate it. So all of a sudden, I'm like, okay, at least now, uh, first, my first speech was so depressing. I had to rewrite it. My boyfriend at the time was like, okay, you can't present that. So I revised it to be a bit more funny, but also to realize now you have the opportunity, you have the chance of having the science behind it. This has been documented. These are systemic uh, issues that happen in our society. So you know it's happening. So now we actually have coping mechanism and we can actually, um, there's mechanism where women would reinforce one another in the meeting so we can actually support each other's ideas since we have less credibility. And if I talk my own horn, um, it's not gonna be credible as opposed to a man that does it. So instead I'll ask you Kekashan to actually say, well, Chantal Lynn, yes, she is an expert and I'll do the same to you or to one of our friends because it is not the same if we do ourselves. So I think there, there, there's still a lot of work to do, but we're making progress because at least now we're recognizing it and we're starting to uh, put in place processes to address those systemic discrimination. And I just wanted to read to you, Kekashan, and sorry for taking so long, but it's pretty crazy. If you have not seen, the Secretary General made a speech uh, yesterday for the uh, young women from, from civil society organization. And he actually talked of thousand years of patri patriarchy that we actually have to work against now um, if we actually want to achieve equality. So I invite you, these uh, the Secretary General speech are all online. I invite you to, to consult it. Yeah, I, I definitely, and I, I actually watched part of uh, his speech yesterday so I uh, I know exactly what you're talking about and it is so important that you know we recognize uh, these issues and it's a good thing that you know we know that these problems are in place but now we have to continue to take the steps to make sure that we're able to solve these problems and I agree with you on all of these problems and I'm sure Madhumita and Tanya can also vouch for that that we've all faced these challenges at some point or the other and just the other day at a meeting I said something and a male colleague said the exact same thing and was lauded by the audience. Whereas I was like, I just said the same thing. So yeah, it, it is very weird, but I think that uh, together as women, I think we can, and with our allies, we can move forward and make a difference. So yeah, back to you, Matamita. Um, my question is, what kind of support did you have to overcome these challenges? Well, uh, at the beginning, not much. As I said, I did not realize it. It took me, it took me, you know, half my career to realize that there was these system exchanges. And then, however, I was very lucky because um, I had a wonderful and supportive bosses all of my life. And um, whether they were male or female, both they were always very supportive and having great advice for me and um, lovely to emulate them because they were human centric. They were not just managing 
people. They, they were leaders. And so I had a great chance. And, um, and I, I, you know, I would, I would really advise um, all the young women and men out there, don't choose a school or a program. Choose an advisor when you go to grad school because that makes such a big difference. If you're interested in an issue, then find that one person that you want to work with and you want to emulate because that gives you so much more. And also, you know, many people have talked about Sheryl Sandberg's book and you may be against her, her post at Facebook and what Facebook book does, but a lot of people have commented her book and have not really read the book. And I must say, I really recommend people reading her Lean In book because it, it is very well documented and it gives a lot of these examples, but it also gives a lot of, of, of solutions so that if Kekeshan you say something before may recuperate it, I can say, as Kekeshan said, and repeat what she said, and then we repeat each other so that we act, it actually sinks in. Um, and now there's also these, these leaning groups that have been created at the UN. We have the UN Win Network, which is a woman in, in international uh, network. So we actually can support each other. We are there to hear each other, to sometimes let our frustration out. So it's with one another when we're supportive as opposed to out there. So there are some, um, some tools now that are out there and all of the women like you, we can support each other. Um, to, to overcome these challenges. And I do believe we're going to get there, but we need our male partners uh, to help us and our young um, gentlemen that are growing now um, that are, I think, are much more aware of these issues and we can work with on. Um, one, of, one of the, you know, one of the things that I've seen as uh, to work, um, because we keep thinking about there's not enough women in senior management. So why are there not women in senior management? It has to, nothing to do with intelligence or leadership. On the contrary, uh, and the Secretary General said it several times, the countries that have best handled the pandemic are countries led by women. So it's not a leadership issue. But what happened is women will not apply. It's also part of our fault. We will not apply to job unless we have 90 some percent of the requirement. While men will apply lo lower. We need to work on our self-esteem and our self-confidence. But at the same time, we need to have these male in the middle um, career range that part of their duty is to actually identify male and women um, that um, their part of their duty and and pay is related to how they identify promising women at this level to be groomed to be becoming senior management. So I'm not sure if that answer your question, but that's it's kind of a broader reflection. No, I think it definitely answered uh, the question because yes, we need a support system where we have a network of women who support each other and lift each other up. And at the same time, we need our male allies to uh, work with us because we cannot achieve gender equality if just women are trying to uh, take, the, uh, take it forward. We need every single person at the table and have that concrete, uh, fruitful discussion in order to actually bring about change and recognize where people are going are wrong. So thank you so much for sharing that with us. I'm going to try and see if Tanya is uh, with us again. Tanya, are you with us? We still are experiencing some uh, technical difficulties with Tanya. So I shall move on to the next thing that we uh, wanted to uh, know about. So you mentioned earlier uh, that your area of expertise was in economics and it, the economy is one of the three pillars of sustainable development. And very often that gets ignored when we're talking about sustainability, where it's, it's just focusing on the environment and the society. But the economy does play such an important role as a third pillar of sustainability. So we wanted to know how did you connect your expertise in economics to sustainable development? Yeah, well, it was kind of easy for me, Kekashan, because um, I, I grew up on a self subsistence farm in the north of, part of Quebec, and so I always liked the environment and natural resources. So I went to McGill to do a agriculture, to go to get a degree in agricultural uh, science. I did not know at that time because the first year at McGill is uh, you do a the, the share the same classes. So you do soil science, animal science, plant science, um, and so and, and economics. And, um, and of course I took English because my English was so bad. <laughs> but um, then you basically decide, and I was really skating between agricultural and environmental economics. 
um, and engineering, agricultural engineering. But I literally, and this is where, you know, you young people trying to torture yourself, trying to decide what you're going to do. I literally flipped the coin and chose, and basically I chose economics, agricultural economics. So if you do agricultural economics, you have to do the environment because you can't, the agriculture is so intrinsically linked to the environment. And my bachelor's, my master's, and my thesis, my PhD thesis were all about integrating and modeling um, the, the environmental impact of the agricultural system and helping our decision maker to minimize the impact of the agricultural sector on the environment while creating job and adding economic growth. As you know, Kakashan agriculture is very important in the, the Canadian economy. So, for instance, one of my first job was a contract uh, with uh, Statistics Canada. We have an input-output table, which is the macro economy, the whole economy, the Canadian economy. And so we had one um, vector, one um, um, that was basically the agricultural sector. And so we had disaggregated that into livestock and dairy and the others so we can have a more granular view. But then once we did that, we basically developed then a, a matrix of environmental impact. So how much pesticide, how much uh, fertilizer um, and trying to, and we didn't have a lot of the data, but working with engineers to be able to, to basically try to model not only the economic and job creation impact of agricultural policies, but also the environmental impact. I did the same for my PhD where it was modeling how do you target farmers that have the largest, you model the impact of the, the farmers in terms of the affluent to the Chesapeake Bay and how much that in fact impeded the fishermen in the, um, in the Chesapeake Bay and then trying to target your policy. So I had to model depending on what policies we put in place, which um, practices farmers would adopt and then what impact would that have on the Chesapeake Bay. So throughout my career, I pretty much um, always did the ag environmental and, and the labor part. When I joined, when I finished my PhD and I work at IFPRI, the International Food Policy Research Institute, again, my role was to collect data, go into the settlement um, where they had small olders from the south of Brazil that were put in the Amazon. And they were deforesting to be able to, to feed themselves and their family. And they were given these lots to be able to farm. And the whole idea was, how can we increase their income, their, their, their food security, without adding to deforest as much by increasing their food productivity um, and reducing the labor that they would need so their kid can go to school. So from the beginning, you can see, I've always been working in the, the, the uh, economic, the environment, and, and the social part together. And then when I came back from Brazil, I work at the NVA Wallace Institute for Sustainable Agriculture, where we look at the impact of the large confined operations, uh, like these huge mega farm of, of hogs and, and dairies that you see out there. Um, so for me, it was kind of a natural. I feel like taking a, a, an approach of economic, environmental, and social is something that I've always done. And it's just now that we're calling it sustainable development, but I've been doing sustainable development all my life. And I'm passionate about it, as you know. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but that is truly amazing to know that you have uh, just uh, unconsciously linked the economy, society and the environment and also recognizing that, you know, you can't uh, focus on one pillar without uh, invariably focusing on one or both of the other. So thank you so much for sharing that with us and for our viewers who are involved in the field of sustainable development. It is so beneficial for them as well to know that all of these pillars are linked that, and we are and they will be able to address these issues as they move uh, ahead in their uh, careers. So thank you so much for sharing that with us. Back to you, Matamita. Um, I wanted to ask you, how did you feel when you became the chief of the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development, New York Office of the United Nations Secretary General? I jumped. <laughs> Uh, I was I was very very pleased. I mean, it, I, how did I feel? I don't know, but I was so happy. I've been applying to several positions without success. I don't know if some of you have probably applied. It's really hard, um, and it affects your self confidence because you don't hear back and you don't you don't get accepted. So you feel like you're not good enough. 
And when I saw this position being posted, and as you know, all the jobs at the UN are posted on inspira.un.org for the secretariat. And I saw that and I told myself, this is me. So I need this one. I'm going to put all the effort because this one can't pass because um, of the work I've done on trade, the work I've done, because you can't do just like when you do agriculture, you can't do agriculture without doing environment and economics, you also can't do agriculture without doing trade. So I went and worked on trade. And at that time I had to work at the NAFTA uh, for seven, seven, seven years. So I had the ag, I had the development part, which I did in, if in the Brazilian Amazon. I was like, okay, this is, this is, I got to be getting this job. And I was, when I was finally the one, the, the three finalists that was, uh, uh, asked to come to Geneva to meet the Secretary General, so he makes the final decision. I was so nervous. I mean, it's unbelievable. And then, um, unfortunately, as usual, some these these job can take a lot of time. So it took months before I heard that, and I kept oscillating between this hope, keeping hope, and keeping that yes, this job is for me, and this kind of disappointment that, oh, I'm not going to get it again. It's going to be a disappointment, a deception. And I put really my heart and my, my, my soul into this. So as you can imagine, when I finally got that email announcing my nomination, I just jumped and felt vindicated and, rec and recognized. Yeah. Then understood because I, and it's just, it's just so good because when you keep, and, and this is a lesson, you keep applying for these jobs, do not take it personally. You are good and you might be, you might have been the, the best person, but for some reason, and at the UN, we have to balance the regional and, you know, may, if, if, among three person, person with equal uh, capacity, they may choose somebody from a different region of the world to balance things out. Um, so, yeah, so I, I just was ecstatic. <laughs> That's the bottom line. <laughs> oh, that is wonderful. And yeah, congratulations. And that is something that, like I keep, uh, saying you are a role model for us to look up to and understand and, uh, that you know there is so much that we can achieve through hard work, through positivity, and as you uh, just mentioned right now, I'm sure all of us as young people will be taking that advice uh, as we move forward in our career. <laughs> so yeah, thank you so much for sharing that uh, with us. Over to you, Tanya. Thank you. We are very lucky to have you in us today. You have accomplished so much. So I would like to ask you, how did it feel when you look back at and reflect on When I look back? I think the question was when you look back at your journey, how do you feel like when you reflect on your ah. Well, so good to see you, Tanya. And then, you know, this is this is the, the, the perfect example of the digital divide. Tanya is in Bangladesh and her connection is not great. And if we don't solve that problem, we will not achieve equality uh, in this world, especially with this pandemic where everything goes online. So Tanya, thank you so much for your patience and staying with us. Um, and um, on your question, I don't know what to answer, except that I feel good. Um, I feel like, you know, I've made, I had impact and I feel like I've, uh, I've met great people like you, Kakeshan, and others uh, that are committed and passionate about the world and making it better. But I also feel like there's so much more to do um, and so little time. <laughs> I don't know if it's a good answer, but that's how I feel. No, you are right. I feel like that all the time that there is so much more to do and at Green Hope we complete one event and then we're like oh what do we do next because there's so much more that we want to do and want to achieve and want to help so yeah we uh, we completely agree with uh, you on that so thank you for saying that out loud I don't think you said a lot that you know there's so much more that we need to do and we don't have that much of time so thank you and uh, over especially to now Kakeshan because yeah. there's an emergency right now um, and this digital divide is really, if we don't address this, developing countries will be left behind. And we need a certain, there's an emergency right now with, that, with the pandemic. We have to work hard to make sure that the, the, the poorest people and the most marginalized within our countries, but also in the poorest countries are not left behind. We need solidarity and hard work now more than ever. Absolutely. And at Greenhope, we have been conducting workshops, education workshops for children, both in urban and marginalized environments. And Tanya, 
in Bangladesh has actually been taking a lot of risks to go out and uh, educate the children in the marginalized communities and the women as well over there because they don't have access to the Wi-Fi or any kind of digital device. But she's able to provide them with that uh, education, of course, practicing social distancing. But that is our small way of making sure that they continue their education. So yes, that is something that is so important that we need to address and do before it is too late. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the work you do. Awesome. And yes, Tanya is doing really amazing work in Bangladesh uh, right now. But thank you, Tanya. <laughs> awesome. But uh, I'll pass it on to Matamita now. As a person in leadership position, do you feel that people view you differently because you are a woman or has the society evolved uh, to see you as a leader regardless of your gender? Yeah, that's, that's a good question too. Um, as, as I said before, um, until my, I reached senior management position, I didn't feel it. Um, I feel now we have such a long way to go. And actually, those that watched the Secretary General's uh, uh, speech yesterday saw in some of the UN um, document lately, is women are falling behind. We're losing the gain that we've made for women. Uh, we're losing decades of work now um, with this pandemic as women are the majority in unpaid care work, take care of the children that are home uh, or their elders. Um, and if, if our government gonna put in place austerity measure, again, women will be the most affected and they're also the frontline workers. So there's so much that we need to do and we're, we were not on track actually to achieve equality as we prepare. If you look at these, co the Committee on Status of Women, Commission on Status of Women, the, as we start preparing the 25 years of Beijing, um, we basically start thinking, oh, it's going to be great. We're going to celebrate. And instead, the team that was decided by our colleague at UN Women was pushing back against the pushback. And we have to be really, really careful um, because um, in general, um, we're, we're making progress. Um, and despite the fact that it's proven for companies, for organization, for government, the more diverse the decision-making uh, process is, the better it is so by women and by uh, a, a various group in different countries and different um, um, representation is better. But yet we're getting some, some, some backlash, uh, which a lot of countries are trying to restrict the, the, the role of women and their power. Um, and especially, I think if you haven't seen the, there's women economists, uh, no, women feminist economists network um, and some of the work they've done is is kind of um, puts you to, to really thinking about these issues because on the one end what they're documenting is as women are getting more and more on in the job market we're seeing at the same time a dying out of a lot of manufacturing in a lot of countries so the the middle class people with lower education male are losing their job. And despite the fact it's not due to the women being more present in the workforce, there's a resentment towards women because at the same time that they're losing their job, more women are getting into the workforce. And, and we really have to be careful because this is not, a, it can never be us versus them. We have to be in this together. We, women and men, their fathers, their sisters, their brothers, um, and this, this cannot be one against the others. We also have to be careful with these quotas and positive discrimination where they're put in place. Sometimes they're needed and they're successful, like in Iceland and board um, that where if they have a percentage of women that have to be on the board. But there has been some backlash in Sweden for extensions. So instances when it's basically trying to push women and yet not enough of, of men and they feel that they do not have an opportunity. So I feel that we are in maybe in one of those very critical moments where we really, really need to work all together um, to ensure that we don't go back and that together we move forward and the society benefit because um, there are more diverse decision making. Absolutely. And when we're talking about gender equality, it's imperative that we have all genders at uh, the table. And, you know, in an ideal world, every single person would get a job or would get any kind of opportunity based on their merit and not because of any other social determinant. But hopefully we are able to achieve that once we all start 
working together and let's see how uh, it goes. So yeah, over to you, Danya. Uh, thank you. With us, we know that you have obtained your PhD in agriculture and environmental economics. You were a consultant to Dania, are you with us? I think we have. Tanya, we were unable to hear your uh, question. Could you please repeat? That? Can you hear me now? Yes, it's a little better. Yeah. I don't think we are able to uh, hear uh, Tanya, but I think from what she has just written uh, to me, she wants to know if you can share with us a particular experience uh, or accomplishment that, uh, you know, really changed your perspective of the world or influenced you drastically, basically something that had a lasting impact on your life. Yeah, maybe I'll cheat and I'll say two. <laughs> right. One of them was uh, during my bachelor's, we went with um, uh, the then um, uh, ACDI, uh, SIDA in Canada. We went to visit um, four farmers in Chile and work with them. And that changed my vision of the world and really gave me this, uh, this, this uh, desire to, to work at the international level. Uh, but another thing, and that's going to be interesting, I think, for this group of, uh, of uh, young, uh, bright mind like yours. Um, I was at McGill and uh, I think I was in my first years of bachelor's. And uh, I saw this sign on the, on the, um, in the department um, that said there was a summer fellowship at Virginia Tech uh, for, for the coming summer. And I looked at it almost dribbling and, and you know, like I was so, I was like, oh my God, and I wish I could go. And, and when I mentioned the importance of mentor, my advisor then walked by and said, well, why don't you apply? I look at him like, are you kidding me? There's no point applying, I would never get it. And he's like, well, you're never going to know if you don't apply. I don't see why you wouldn't be accepted if you apply, or at least you have a chance. Um, and so I, I, hesitated, I hesitated and eventually applied. I got the summer fellowship, and this is, I loved it. I met one of the best women professional I ever met in my life, was my mentor and my advisor. Uh, in, she was the youngest woman uh, head of her agricultural department in the South. She was the youngest uh, president of the agricultural, uh, U.S. Agricultural Economics Association. She was such a wonderful um, human being. And so uh, I learned so much from her. And I would have not known um, if I did not just take, give myself the little chance and have enough confidence to just apply and get there. And I went eventually do my PhD there. Um, and yeah, so that was a game changer. Thank you so much for uh, sharing that with us. And yes, I think taking that just one step out of your comfort zone is something that, you know, we have to learn to take that risk. Otherwise we will never be able to move uh, forward. So thank you for sharing that uh, with our viewers. Over to you, Madhumita. Um, yeah. Can you tell us one accomplishment in your journey that you're most proud of? Uh, I'd say um, getting the trust and the fundraising and organizing the unprecedented NGO, private sector, local authority participation in Rio Plus 20 that eventually led to the mandate to negotiate the SDGs and then supporting again um, all non-state actors negotiation, uh, participation and contribution to the SDG negotiation because they're the most ambitious goal that humanity has set for itself. And I really think that in these hard times, it's good to have a North Star. Absolutely. And this is why I met Kekashan and a lot of people like you that are committed and wonderful and it keeps you, it keeps you, it keep, it keeps your hopes up. That's lovely to hear. Can you actually talk to us a bit more about uh, your, like, because you were such a big part of the SDGs negotiations. And as you said, the sustainable development goals are such an important 
part of our lives now. So uh, can you talk a bit more about what it was like to be a part of the negotiations of such a monumental uh, agreement? Yeah, well, where to start? First of all, you know, I'm a, as we mentioned, I'm an agri agricultural environmental economist. I'm not somebody that used to work with civil society. So that was, it's one of my director that came um, and decided, oh, you're gonna do some, you're gonna do the major coordination of the major group. I'm like, because they're called major group, as you know, major group of civil society. So there's nine of them that were decided at Earth Summit. And so uh, I told him, I literally told him, you're kidding me. And he said, no. <laughs> So this is why I said I had to earn the trust of the groups that, um, you know, I was there for them, with them. And, um, and many of them, uh, I felt that we could not just have the NGOs that can afford to be in New York. Uh, that would be a failure. So I did fundraise. And at the time, the DESA, the Department of Economic and Social Affairs, where I, where I work, would have these regional consultation alongside the Regional Economic Commission's meeting in preparation for Rio plus 20. And so I went to the EU, I, I did my homework, I look at who could be financing civil society participation um, into these processes. And the EU was actually offering some funding. So I initially got 750,000 euros to be able to organize um, training and briefing along for the civil society, private sector, local authorities, NGOs, farmers groups, women's group, youth group um, at these uh, meetings. And it was difficult because they were like, who are you coming from New York telling us what's gonna happen and how it's gonna happen. But if we didn't do that, then there's no ownership. These, these group needed to feel like their voice will be heard in, in New York. And so once we did one round, I basically then went back to the EU and trust me, the EU and the United Nations are two large bureaucratic system. And so this was not an easy process to manage. And my team was very small, but I totally was convinced it was very important that we need to amplify those voices. And so I got another 1 million euro uh, and then to ask groups to reach out. And the best was, and uh, this is where Kekesha and you were part of it, it was the children and youth major group that actually, and this is, this is remember, this is 2012, doesn't seem to so far, but this was the first time that I actually heard of Google Doc. And I learned that from children and youth. Um, it's the first time I learned about, you know, all, all these, these online tools that we could use. Um, and, and children and youth are the one that set the path for the others and they would develop these um, these regional groupings and then they would break each other up into thematic areas so that they can actually all contribute. Um, and then it was it was the coordination so that um, when we started the negotiation of the SDGs, it was hard because member state insisted and, and rightfully so this is an intergovernmental process. But we needed to have the buy-in from the civil society. And I always believe in crowdsourcing ideas. And so I was trying to figure out a way, and I convinced then the two co-chairs were wonderful uh, from Hungary and from uh, Kenya, um, to basically agree that they would hear the major groups in the morning between 8 and 10 before the big official beginning of the negotiation. And we also convinced them um, along with my other colleagues, that they needed to set a schedule, an agenda with thematic area for the next 18 months. So groups can actually prepare themselves and consult properly back home and be able to report. And so we did that and it was extremely successful. And then there's meeting, the beginning of these meetings, we did um, one half was about taking stock, the other half was the negotiation of what needed to happen. And when we started the negotiation on targets and goals, member state, they negotiate, so they don't want to show their hands. So the chair would actually use what was said in the major groups discussion before these meetings to actually launch the debate and say, well, the women major group this morning suggested that we have a goal on uh, gender equality and economic empowerment of women. What do you think? And then it started the debate and everybody went on. So it went, yeah, I could, I could write and I could talk about this for a long time, but it was very, very a, a fortunate time that, that to be part of these rooms and having such leadership and I think we, it's part, you know, it's, it's talent. These are, are the co-chair were magnificent. Uh, and then Ireland did the, uh, the, the negotiation when we got to the, um, 
to the final SDGs and the, uh, to the GA. But, um, and, and it's also was uh, the fact that they accepted the crowdsourcing and then the inclusion of all the voices that helped with the uh, success. But also we were lucky. If we try to do that now, we probably couldn't, given the change in geopolitics. So we have to share with those SDGs. <laughs> Absolutely. No, but I do remember uh, those uh, days of having the major groups uh, negotiations, well, uh, discussions before the main negotiations. And I actually didn't know that that was the first time that they were actually doing that. So that's amazing. Thank you for uh, sharing that with us. And uh, yeah, the SDGs have played such a fundamental role in our lives. And I'm so glad that, you know, it, civil society did have a voice in that because it's so important that especially with the mandate of leaving no one behind and achieving a life of dignity for all, we have to involve all sections of society. So thank you. Yeah. And sorry to interrupt your question, but oh, no. you know, without civil society, we would not have SDG 10 and we would not have SDG 5 because wow. it's civil society fighting to keep those goals that we have those. So equality and uh, would not be as a, 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 a goal in itself. Wow. I did not know that. Wow. So yeah, and th those are like two of the main uh, goals that so many of us work on with we're trying to reduce inequalities all across the world and of course trying to achieve gender equality. So that, I mean, I can't even think about SDGs without those. Without them, right? Yeah. There you go. <laughs> so, but, but yeah, that's amazing with just civil society involvement. Thank you for sharing that with us. Uh, Tanya, over to you. Yeah. Yes, I'm here. I'm sorry for my connections, but... Uh, Thank you so much for your uh, kind words and experiences. What gives you the positive energy every day to go out and make a difference in people's lives? Uh, what gives me the positive energy to, 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 to do the work I do? Uh, what gives you the positive energy every day to go out and make a difference in people's lives? Yeah, thank you, Tanya. Um, just a conviction that each one of us can make a difference. I do believe that, um, but it takes uh, persistence. It takes, um, yeah, it, it takes, yeah, a lot of persistence. I'm an endurance athlete, so I go out and run, you know, hours. And um, yeah, I, I just believe we, each one of us, um, can make a difference and also we can't leave it to somebody else we have to be involved we need to, the sdgs are clear we only can achieve them if we all contribute um and the situation is 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 very hard right now for developing countries and i think i just sleep better at night if i know that i've done my little bit during the day absolutely uh, my mom tells me the same thing that you know it's so important that you do something that allows you to sleep uh, well, at night, and that's what we strive to do at uh, Green Hope Foundation, our own bit. So thank you for sharing that with us. Over to you, Mother Mita. Looking back, is there anything that you would do differently? Wow. Not really. I mean, I think things I have, you know, I, I, I believe in deterministic determination and, you know, I, I love my career. I love my life. Um, maybe I would put less pressure on myself. You know, when I was younger in my career, I worked really, really hard. I was a bit of an art workaholic. Um, maybe I'll spend more time with my mom, which whom I lost since then. But other than that, um, I, I can't say I regret much that I've done, except, you know, maybe Take a bit more time and, you know, please spend time with your moms and your, your dad because you're never going to regret that time. <laughs> Absolutely. We will definitely uh, do that. Uh, over to you, Tanya. Thank you so much. Uh, I would like to ask, what is a normal day in your life? <laughs> a normal day? Wow. The one, the wonderful thing about working at the UN uh, and being chief of the New York office, which is a small, nimble office and dynamic, is that there's no such thing as a normal day. Uh, but I guess the one thing I do every morning is I get up, I go run, bike or swim, um, and I eat a good breakfast because I think that's important. Uh, we, can't, we can't forget our health. Our health is very important if we want to be able to contribute to society. Then I bike to work. 
Um, and typically on the bike, I've already, as I admire the landscape of, of New York, I start thinking of, of problem and how we can contribute. Generally, we have a few meetings with my colleague in Geneva. Um, so, you know, to discuss the work that they're doing, how we can uh, bring it to help um, the groups in New York that are negotiating. Uh, then I, of, I will often meet with uh, the G77 chair or their, uh, their office. Um, as well as some G77 countries that want to hear, um, they want us to hear what their concerns are and so we can feed back that into Geneva, the substantive work and the technical cooperation we do, but also the, the EU and the JustCan or the partners, how can we bring them on board to make sure, because as you know, UNCTAD, or you may not know, I should say that, the UN Conference on Trade and Development was created by developing countries and we help developing countries mostly, but we can't do that without the partners. So we do work with the partners, but we also work a lot with the least developed countries, the landlocked developing countries. So Bangladesh was the chair of the LDC not long ago, landlocked developing countries, the SIDS, small island developing states uh, that have major concern in terms of trade and, and development. And so meeting with them, uh, hearing where they would need more of our help, and then feeding them, going through what we've, we're producing in, in Geneva, um, where we work in, tree, in, in, in a triad. So first of all, we do a lot of substantive work. So that's the think tank part. So we do a lot of documentation, evidence base, and policy um, to be able to develop policy advice. Then we, at the request of country, we come in and we actually do investment policy review, trade policy review, entrepreneurship policy review, including E-Trade for Women, um, and um, competition review. So we help countries with their policies and bringing on board all of the stakeholders. And then from that, we extract what actually work and how partner can, can help. For instance, we've been talking about the digital divide, and we find that there's in, there's very little money in terms of international development aid that is going to help countries um, address the infrastructure that they need for, for having, um, uh, be able to, to, to keep up with the digitalization of the economy. Um, we also help them with um, having a uh, model for women. So we have an E-Trade for, for, for All initiative, which bring all um, several international organizations, the private sector, countries, and it's meant to be a one-stop shop for, for developing countries to develop their capacity to trade internationally online. And then we realize women, of course, face additional constraint. So what do we do? We created E-Trade for Women, so that women your age can see in their own region um, a woman uh, that is in the digital space in, in doing online commerce or uh, using the internet to develop their business. So we have one in Iran, we have one in um, China, Mexico, Indonesia, um, which one am I forgetting? Anyway, so you can see, uh, oh, uh, Cote d'Ivoire, Rwanda, um, so we have one for me. So the, and then what we do is we work, organize master classes. So we follow with them on this, so that they can actually they help each other, they network, uh, but they also role model for other young women like you in their region. Um, then we also take part. I take part in interagency coordination meetings, especially on that contribute to the financing for development. Um, and so we're the focal point on sovereign debt, on trade, technology, investment. So you know, uh, contribute to those meetings in terms of with the other UN agencies and the bank and the IMF and the World Trade Organization and others. We also I have meeting on the technology facilitation mechanism that we co-chair with DESA. Uh, strategize my team and um, yeah so it's and then meet non-state actors like you um, and uh, we receive sometimes university students sometimes we receive delegation from developing countries that come and visit us um, yeah so it, it varies from day to day but that's kind of generally what what we do wow that that's amazing and you're one busy person and that's that's awesome, really. That is, that's, that's what you've done so much and continue to do so much. So uh, we really commend you for the work that you have done and continue to do. And we really wish you all the best in your uh, future endeavors. So uh, I shall pass the floor to Matamita now. Um, it would be great if you could tell us about your role models at different stages of your journey. Yeah, 
You know, it's mostly been, as I mentioned, my bosses and, um, and they've been male and female. Um, and my advisors at the university and I, um, and also Nelson Mandela, you know, just this persistence, not giving up, even when there seemed to be no hope and you're locked down somewhere that you cannot, we cannot afford to lose hope, uh, that we just need to keep going. Um, yeah. Thank you for sharing that with us. And you know, this past hour, we have learned so much uh, from you. And I think that every single one of our viewers will take away so many uh, lessons that will help them as they move forward in their own journeys. So the last thing that we just wanted to ask you is what would be your message to everyone, but especially to girls who dare uh -huh. to dream? Well, yeah, dream and believe, but don't forget you need to work hard. I do not believe this idea that if you just believe and you're passionate, things gonna fall on your lap. I just don't believe that. So work hard for the things that you want, but keep the balance between work, family, and sport and training. Um, and then the other thing, Kakeshan, I really, you know, do in growth sector, go to IT, artificial intelligence, math, and combine it with art. We need more women in these fields to influence the problem that we study and the solution that we provide for them. We need senior women in these positions. So please do in these growth sector. We need more women with wealth. Women own less than 10% of the wealth on this planet. And as long as we don't have the wealth, we will be begging for um, anything. So as you, you may know, or, or maybe you don't know, but I have a group of friends of, around me and we created the Equality Moonshot. And we really, the Equality Moonshot is that we want more women to go in growth sector so that they actually earn more, they own the wealth, and they can actually influence decisions, they influence uh, policies, and they actually influence redistribution of income. Um, and so, yeah, I think that's my, my, my advice to you. Do what you're passionate about, but link it, to try to link it to IT and AI and, and automation, because these are all growth sectors. And, 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 and link it with the things that you like. And so find something in there so you can actually make a difference in these very um, um, sectors that are going to move, they're moving very fast and we need more women making decisions in these sectors. Absolutely. We, we do need that. And you also mentioned how important it is to work hard. And I think it's so important. Uh, crucial for all of us as, as young people, especially to understand that, yes, it's important to have a dream and the passion, but it's so important to work hard for it and work for it instead of just believing it's going to come to you on the platter. And especially as women, I think we have to work, take that extra step to make sure that you know, we work that slightest bit harder to ensure that we get uh, what we want. Hopefully in the future, uh, we are able to get a, uh, our opportunities based on merit. But for now, yes, we do have to work harder than a lot of people to get what we want. So thank you so much for being with us today. And uh, yeah, we have learned so much from you and uh, we hope to e-meet, well, not just e-meet, but physically meet you soon as well. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you. Keep the great work. And I'm so happy. I'm so honored to be here with you today. And thank you for all the great work you're all doing. And we count on you, the, the young women. You're you're here and you know, I have all my hope in you. And I'm here to help as you know, Kakesha. Thank you so much. And yes, just thank you so much, Dr. Carpentier for like being such an amazing role model and just for sharing your inspirational journey. And you know, every conversation we have with you is such a learning experience <laughs> as was said by a lot of our members when they heard that you were uh, coming and featuring on our episode today and your suggestions on using just the this opportunity in the current situation and just in general all the lessons that we've learned from you today it's really going to help us in uh the future and respond positively to how we can create bring about change in different fields whether it's in trade or climate change or tackling rising inequalities and yeah, uh, this decade has begun with an unprecedented challenge, but I think from your talk today, it's uh, allowed us to understand that uh, this is really our 
final wake up call for all of us to rethink our approaches as we work towards creating a sustainable and equitable and just world for all. And also understanding that we must have the passion and the dream, but we also must work hard to achieve what we want to achieve to a world where girls and women are on an even keel. So thank you so much for motivating us as always. And for our viewers on Zoom and on Facebook Live, we shall see you at our next episode of Women Impacting the World. Please stay safe, take all precautions because the pandemic is not yet over, but we shall see you at our next episode. Thank you so much and have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you, Tanya. Thank you, Madumita. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you.